This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 1, Chapter 16 through 29. Meanwhile, Caesar daily called upon the Aedui for the grain which, as he reminded them, they had promised in the name of their government. Gaul being situated, as the narrative has shown, beneath a northern sky, the climate is cold, and therefore not only was the standing corn unripe, but there was not even a sufficient supply of fodder. While Caesar was unable to use the grain which he had brought from the Seine in barges because the Helvetii had struck off from that river, and he was unwilling to move away from them. From day to day the Aedui kept him on the expectant, affirming that the grain was being collected, was on the way, was just at hand. When the day on which the men's rations would be due was near, feeling that his patience had been tried too long, he assembled their leading men, of whom he had a large number in camp, amongst others Divicacus and Liscus, the chief magistrate, the Virgobret, as the Aedui call him, who is elected annually and possesses the power of life and death over his countrymen. Caesar took them seriously to task for not helping him in this critical conjuncture, when the enemy were near and it was impossible either to buy corn or to get it from the fields, especially as he had undertaken the campaign in compliance with the entreaties of many of their own representatives. But what he complained of more seriously still was that they had played him false. Caesar's words had their effect upon Liscus. He had before kept silence, but he now spoke out. There were certain individuals, he said, who had great influence with the masses, and unofficially had more power than the magistrates themselves. These men made seditious and violent speeches, and worked upon the fears of the people to prevent them from contributing their due quota of grain. It would be better, they argued, supposing that the Aedui could not for the moment win supremacy over Gaul, to have Gauls for their masters than Romans and they had no doubt that, if the Romans overpowered the Helvetii, they would deprive the Aedui of their liberty, along with the rest of Gaul. These men kept the enemy informed of our plans, and of all that was going on in camp, and they were beyond his control. What was more, he knew that in making these revelations to Caesar, which he had only done under pressure, he had acted at great personal risk, and for that reason he kept silence as long as he could. Caesar perceived that Liscus' remarks pointed to Domnorix, the brother of Divicacus, but, as he did not want these matters to be talked about with a number of people present, he promptly dismissed the assembly, only detaining Liscus. When they were alone, he questioned him about what he had said in the meeting. Liscus spoke unreservedly and boldly. Caesar put the same questions to the other separately, and found that what Liscus said was true. The individual referred to was Demnorix, a man of boundless audacity, extremely popular with the masses from his open-handedness, and an ardent revolutionary. For many years he had farmed at a low rate and monopolized the Aeduan tolls and all the other taxes, as, when he made a bid, no one dared to bid against him. In this way he had increased his fortune and amassed large sums to expend in bribery. He permanently maintained at his own expense a large body of horsemen, whom he kept in attendance upon him. He possessed great influence not only in his own country, but also with the surrounding tribes. And, to strengthen this influence, he had arranged a marriage for his mother with a Beturigian, of the highest rank and highest authority, while his own wife was a Helvetian, and he had arranged marriages for his sisters on the mother's side and from his female relations amongst other tribes. From his connection with the Helvetii, he was a partisan of theirs and well disposed towards them, and he also personally detested Caesar and the Romans, because their coming had lessened his power and restored his brother, Divicacus, to his former influential and honorable position. If anything should befall the Romans, he saw a great reason to hope that, by the aid of the Helvetii, he would secure the throne. While, so long as the Roman people were supreme, he despaired not only of making himself king, but even of retaining his existing influence. Caesar also found, in the course of his inquiries, that, in the disastrous cavalry combat a few days before, it was Dumnorix with his troopers, for he commanded the auxiliary cavalry which the Aedui had sent to Caesar, who had set the example of flight, and that on their flight the rest of the cavalry had taken alarm. 
Caesar's suspicions were now confirmed by positive facts. Dumnorix had opened the way for the Helvetii through the country of the Sequani. He had effected the interchange of hostages between the two peoples. He had done all this not only without the authority from himself or his own tribe, but actually without the knowledge of either, and his accuser was the chief magistrate of the Aedui. Having made these discoveries, Caesar thought there was sufficient ground for his either punishing him himself or calling upon the state to punish him. There was one objection. Caesar had come to know that Divicacus, Demnorix's brother, felt the utmost devotion to the Roman people and the utmost good will towards himself, and that his loyalty, equity, and good sense were quite exceptional. In fact, he was afraid of offending Divicacus by punishing his brother. Accordingly, before taking any definite step, he sent for Divicacus, and, dismissing the ordinary interpreters, conversed with him through the medium of Gaius Valerius Tricolus, a leading provincial and intimate friend of his own, whom he trusted absolutely in all matters. Reminding Divicacus of what had been said about Dumnorix at the meeting when he was present, and at the same time telling him what every one had separately said about him when alone with himself, he urgently requested him to consent to his either personally trying Dumnorix and passing judgment upon him, or else calling upon the state to do so and not to take offense. Bursting into tears, Divicaicus embraced Caesar and entreated him not to take severe measures against his brother. He knew, he said, that the story was true, and no one suffered more from his brother's conduct than himself, for at a time when his own influence was paramount with his countrymen and in the rest of Gaul, and his brother, on account of his youth, was powerless, the latter had risen through his support, and the resources and strength which he had thus acquired he used not only to weaken his influence, but almost to ruin him. Still, public opinion as well as fraternal affection had weight with him. If Dumnorix were severely dealt with by Caesar, then, considering his own friendly relations with the latter, no one would believe that he was not responsible, and the result would be that the feeling of the whole country would turn against him. He continued pleading at great length, and with tears when Caesar grasped his hand, reassured him, and begged him to say no more, telling him that he valued his friendship so highly, that, out of regard for his loyalty and his intercession, he would overlook both political injury and personal grievance. He then called them Norx, keeping his brother by, pointed out what he had to find fault with in his conduct, stated that he knew about him and the complaints which his own countrymen brought against him, warned him to avoid giving any ground for suspicion in the future, and told him that he would overlook the past for his brother Divicaicus's sake. Nevertheless, he placed Dumnorix under surveillance in order to ascertain what he was doing and who were his associates. On the same day, Caesar was informed by his patrols that the enemy had encamped at the foot of a hill eight miles from his own camp, and accordingly sent a party to reconnoiter the hill and find out what the ascent was like from the rear. They reported that it was quite practicable. In the third watch, he explained his plans to Titus Labinus, his second in command, and ordered him to ascend to the summit of the hill with two legions. In the fourth watch, he marched in person against the enemy, following the route by which they had advanced and sending on all the cavalry in front. Publius Considius, who was considered a thorough soldier, and had served in the army of Lucius Sulla and afterwards in that of Marcus Crassus, was sent on in advance with patrols. Daybreak, Libinus was in possession of the summit of the hill, while Caesar was not more than a mile and a half from the enemy's camp, and, as he afterwards learned from his prisoners, his own approach and that of Libinus were unlike unknown when Considius rode up to him at full gallop and stated that the hill which he had desired Libinus to occupy was in possession of the enemy, as he could tell from the arms and crests being Gallic. Caesar withdrew his troops to a hill close by and formed them in a line of battle, Libinus acting on Caesar's order not to engage until he saw his force close to the enemy's camp so that they might be attacked on all sides at once, kept position of the hill, waiting for the appearance of our men, and declined an engagement. At length, late in the day, Caesar learned from his patrols that the hill was in the possession of his own troops, that the Helvetii had moved off, and that Considius from panic had reported as a fact actually seen what he had not seen at all. The same day, Caesar followed the enemy at the usual interval, and pitched his camp three miles from theirs. Next day, as the rations of the army would be due in just forty-eight hours, and he was not more than eighteen miles from Bibrocti, 
by far the wealthiest and most important town of the Idoi, he thought it time to secure his supplies, and accordingly struck off from the route followed by the Helvetii and marched rapidly for Bibracte. The move was reported to the enemy by deserters from Lucius Aemilius, who had commanded a troop of Gallic cavalry. The Helvetii, believing that the Romans were moving away because they were afraid of them, especially as on the day before, though they had occupied a position of vantage, they had declined in action, were confident of being able to cut them off from supplies, altered their plans, reversed their march, and began to hang upon our rear-guard and harass them. Observing this, Caesar withdrew his troops on a hill close by and sent his cavalry to stem the enemy's attacks. Meanwhile, he formed his four veteran legions in three lines halfway up the hill, posting the two which he had recently levied on Kisilpingal and all the auxiliaries above on the ridge, and thus occupying the whole hill. At the same time, he ordered the men's packs to be collected and the space which they covered to be entrenched by the troops posted on the high ground. The Helvetii, following with all their wagons, parked their baggage, repulsed our cavalry with their dense array, and forming a phalanx, moved up against our first line. Caesar sent his first own charger, and then the chargers of all the officers out of sight, in order, by putting all on an equality, to banish the idea of flight. Then he harangued his men, and the battle began. The legionnaires, throwing their javelins from their commanding position, easily broke the enemy's phalanx, and having destroyed their formation, drew their swords and charged. The Gauls were greatly hampered in action by the fact that in many cases several shields were transfixed and pinned together by the impact of one javelin, and, as the iron bent, they could not pull the javelins out, or fight properly with their left arms encumbered, so that many, after the repeated jerks, preferred to drop their shields and fight bare. At length, enfeebled by wounds, they began to fall back and retreat towards a hill about a mile off. They had gained the hill, and the Romans were following after them, when the Boii, and the Tulingi, some fifteen thousand strong, who closed the enemy's columns and served as the rear guard, marched up, immediately attacked the Romans on their exposed flank, and lapped round them. Observing this, the Helvetii, who had retreated to the hill, began to press forward again, and renewed the battle. The Romans effected a change of front and advanced in two divisions. The first and second lines to oppose the enemy whom they had beaten and driven off, the third to withstand the newcomers. Thus two battles went on at once, and the fighting was prolonged and fierce. When the enemy could no longer withstand the onslaughts of the Romans, one division drew back, in continuation of the original movement, up the hill, while the other withdrew to the baggage and wagons. Withdrew, not fled, for throughout the whole of this battle, though the fighting lasted from the seventh hour till evening, none could see an enemy in flight. The far into the night fighting actually went on by the baggage, for the enemy had made a rampart of their wagons, and, from their commanding position, hurled missiles against our men as they came up, while some got between the wagons, and behind the wheels, and threw darts and javelins, which wounded our men. After a long struggle, our men took possession of the baggage and the logger. Orgatorix's daughter and one of his sons were captured on the spot. About 130,000 souls survived the battle and fled without halting throughout the whole of that night. Three days later they reached the country of the Lingones, for our troops remained on the field for three days, out of consideration for their wounded and to bury the dead, and therefore were unable to pursue. Caesar sent dispatches and messages to the Lingones, warning them not to supply the fugitives with corn or otherwise assist them, and threatening that, if they did so, he would treat them as he had treated the Helvetii. After an interval of three days he started with his whole force in pursuit. The Helvetii, under stress of utter destitution, sent envoys to Caesar to propose surrender. The envoys met him on the march, prostrated themselves before him, and in some pliant terms besought him with tears for peace. He told them that the fugitives must remain where they were and await his arrival, and they promised obedience. When Caesar reached the spot, he required the Helvetii to give hostages and to surrender their arms and the slaves who had deserted the, to them. While the hostages and deserters were being searched for, and the arms collected, night came on, and about six thousand men, belonging to the clan known as the Burgini, quitted the Helvetian encampment in the early part of the night and pushed on for the Rhine and the territory of the Germans. Either they were afraid that after surrendering their arms they would be punished, 
or they hoped to get off scot-free, believing that, as the number which had surrendered was so vast, their flight might escape detection or even remain entirely unnoticed. When Caesar discovered this, he ordered the peoples through whose territories they had gone to hunt them down and bring them back if they wished him to hold them guiltless. When they were brought back, he treated them as enemies. But all the rest, after they had delivered up hostages, arms, and deserters, he admitted to surrender. He ordered the Helvetii, the Tilingi, and the Ladobrigi to return to their own country, whence they had come. And, as all their corn and pulse were gone, and they had not in their own country the means of satisfying their hunger, he directed the Alibroges to supply them with corn, and ordered them to rebuild the towns and villages which they had burned. His chief reason for doing this was that he did not wish the region which the Helvetii had abandoned to remain uninhabited, lest the Germans, who dwelt on the further side of the Rhine, might be induced by the fertility of the land to migrate from their own country into theirs, and establish themselves in proximity to the province of Gaul, and especially to Alibroges. The Edui begged to be allowed to find room for the Boii within their own country, as they were a people of eminent and proved courage, and Caesar granted the request. The Edui assigned them lands, and afterwards admitted them to the enjoyment of the rights and liberties on an equality with their own. Documents, written in Greek characters, were found in the encampment of the Helvetii and brought to Caesar. They contained a schedule, giving the names of individuals, the number of emigrants capable of bearing arms, and likewise, under separate heads, the numbers of old men, women, and children. The aggregate amount to 263,000 Helvetii, 36,000 Tulingi, 13,000 Ladobrigi, 23,000 Raraki, and 32,000 Boii. The number capable of bearing arms was 92,000, and the grand total 368,000. A census was taken, by Caesar's orders, of those who had returned home, and the number was found to be 110,000. End of chapter 16 through 29